Is this a safe space? Am I allowed to take a break before the entire world? Every LGBT person that's ever existed starts asking me for the Q Force review. Trust me, I know you want it and it's coming. It's here. You're welcome. All I wanted was just a break. Hi friends, my name is Frat Boy today. <laughs> <laughs> that was a terrible one, Frederick. Today marks the final chapter, the ending, the trilogy of the Q Force series. And before I start, get a load of these earrings. You see that? Oh my god. Oh my god. <gasps> no. I was gonna film me doing my makeup, but y'all didn't deserve it. The work I put into this. I figured why not go back to the original shirt I wore during the first Q Force video and wrap it up. If you don't know, I've made two videos in reaction to the two trailers that Q Force came out. Pun intended. And also, I didn't know people were illiterate because they said, this is such a bad review of the show. You didn't even understand it. And it's like, no kidding. It was the trailer. Christian, what did you want from me? Did you want me to look into the future? It's like, what? look at the date when it's uploaded, please. This might be the longest video I've ever made because we're gonna go throughout each episode. There's 10, each one is around 23 minutes long. Just because I know not everyone's gonna watch it, not everyone can, it's probably banned in some countries knowing, <laughs> knowing them. And it's gonna be the deepest dive into the booty hole of Q-Force. We're going in raw. Dry. Before we start, I just wanna make sure everyone knows this. The trailer do not match the show at all. The only people I blame now for this entire show is Netflix themselves because we know now that the animators and the creators of said show didn't have the control when making the trailer. Netflix made it, everyone shat on it, including me. The animators messaged me and they're like, hey, we didn't ask for this, we didn't approve of it. We hate it too, but please don't let that stop you from watching. So I feel like because the trailer was so bad, people turn into hate watching, kind of like what y'all did with Addison Rae's movie. Everyone's like, why is it trending? Why is it number one? Maybe because y'all keep watching it and talking about it. I don't think it's the best marketing strategy for longevity, just my personal opinion. Did a lot of people watch Q-Force? Yeah, probably, but that trailer sucks, man. Netflix is truly home of phobic. <laughs> Whoever made those trailers, fire them. Okay, let's start. Oh. No necklace too. Sorry about that, y'all. If you wanted to see my initial reaction to each episode, I'm actually going to put it on my Patreon, which I'm gonna start a Patreon now. You can donate how much you want each month because I just don't care. I don't like tears. I think that's a stupid idea. So it's just gonna be my Finsta. You know, I'm eventually going to upload all my reactions because if I do that on here, it gets demonetized because Netflix copyrighted it. I'll be posting stupid pictures of myself just behind the scenes, showing you what I'm doing with my life. And we'll have bi-weekly live streams. Maybe weekly. We'll see. Now let's get into the review. Episode one. We're in 2011, middle of nowhere. We first get introduced to the main character, the protagonist, Steve Merriweather, who is one of the best spies in the agency, which is the AIA. Bye, bitch. It's a montage of his training where he has to beat other guards by shooting them with paintballs, gets in a car, realizes he has to defuse a bomb, then destroys three tanks coming at him with rainbow grenades, and he finishes his test with four minutes and nine seconds, an agency record. So this tells us he's the best of the best, as quoted by V. He's the best of the best. My baby's about to hunt the Taliban. Which on the wiki initially made us think V was in love with a gay man, but we just realized she has a soft spot for him because she's kind of his guardian. She wants him to succeed in this agency. Agent Dirk Chunley, who is the leader of the agency, but is also very misogynistic, clearly homophobic. They want him to be the antagonist of some kind. He announces the graduation of 30 new cadets. And who's valedictorian? Steve. Also, Entering the agency is an all-time high of two women, one of whom is hot and one funny. And that's a reality that happens. You know, we're not gonna pretend and sit here and think women have equal rights as men in the workforce. And if you do think that, oh my God. These are pretty loud. He then says enough about diversity and announces Steve to make a speech. Then he does what we all know happens. Am I gay, man? He comes out to the entire agency because Don't Ask, Don't Tell was repealed. And as you can imagine, the crowd reacted terribly. Steve gives thanks to Celine Dion, Calvin Klein, underwear ads for getting him where he is today. I will say, those ads do something to you as a kid, especially in TJ Maxx. But he gets pushed aside and Agent Buck, who happens to be straight, becomes the new valedictorian. And he gives Steve the nickname Agent Mary, which I'm not going to refer to him as that because there's 
a lot of names in this show. Steve walks away in shame because everyone starts shunning him for his new nickname, but V still sympathizes for him and says, don't worry, you'll be running this place in 10 years. But good news, Steve gets his own division in Hollywood, West Hollywood. We ho. Because where are all of the gays, according to Chun Li? California. <laughs> and he wants Steve to be with his people. When we get there, we see the gays, and by that I mean literally only gay men kissing, frolicking, going through the streets. They're kissing in public, they're shopping for <clears throat> toys, and you know, just being normal human beings, citizens. Fast forward 10 years, we get a great shot of Steve's feet, so to all those people who are into that, there you go, screenshot. He turns on the news and finds out that 30 terrorists were recently captured in the capital of the Democratic Democratic Republic of the Congo. Steve is working out when he gets a call from Agent Buck who refers to him as Ditto. And we learn that he's kind of been in the top. He's meeting with the president again. He's had three medals of honors. Buck is simply the pimple you can't get rid of. A couple walks in and says, Mr. LBB, So we figure out that Steve is getting his side money from hosting his own home as an Airbnb. I don't really know how they make money as spies, but we can assume because he's not in the field actively, he's not getting as much money. Also, I'm not sure where this couple is from, but I love the accent. They're also naked, by the way. There's a lot of naked people in this, so I'm going to censor it. It. And not in the sense that's like, oh, let's sexualize everybody. It's more like, hey, they're naked. You kind of get used to it. This is an adult show. Like, there's a lot of cursing in there. They say the F word, I think, at least once per three minutes. But I also will say it's nice to see a naked woman not have their body instantly objectified. Do the boobs do anything for me? No. <laughs> because we all know why. So they're on vacation. The husband's sitting bare ass on his counter. They compliment Steve's string. They ask where his job is. And the wife says, Are you a rough guard at one of your famous American prisons? Which is just so good. It was so effortless on her part. Steve's fake job is an interior designer. So he says he has to go to his job. He goes outside and he just wraps the corner, presses a button on his garage door and goes inside a secret room. And I'm not sure if this is intentional, but Steve has an upside down pink triangle on his shirt. It looks like a strawberry. But quick history lesson for everyone, the pink triangle used to be used as a form of segregation against homosexuals during concentration camps. They were forced to wear them because they were seen as ill or mentally insane, but then that eventually turned into a form of protest because the pink triangle was flipped so that it could be, you know, taking back power. And it's now a symbol for progress and pride, but I could just be reading into it. But this is where we get introduced to the other characters. They're doing a daily check-in, so Deb is 5'8", weighing in at 165 pounds, in which Deb corrects him by saying, I'm a dense 198 and I worked hard for every pound. And then we learn they haven't done a mission in 10 years, but Deb has been working on their spy car, which is sturdy. Even though it looks like a janky car, we learn that Deb is a very skilled engineer and she can program basically anything into that thing. You'll find out what it does later. Then we hear one of many jokes to come from Twink. Who's Tracy Chapman? I think he's a senator. I'm gonna say it right now, Deb, Stat, and side characters have the greatest lines in the show as in terms of like comedy. Twink, he has good ones, especially in the beginning, but as the show went on, he kind of just inserts himself into every conversation, not in a good way, like it's not funny anymore. So while I do like Twink and his jokes in the beginning, they kind of assume every joke will be good. It should be a well-timed joke instead. He kind of reminds me of Spongebob. <laughs> Next up is Stat. She's one of the best hackers. We find out that she was able to track the Malaysian plane that got lost. Then we have Master of Disguises, Twink, who is a drag queen at night. So that's why he's good at disguising. And this becomes part of his skill in the show. Steve then says he's the best spy in the world and is giving Tori Vega because while we know that most protagonists like they think they're the best but they're not we can't make the protagonist the funniest most athletic most attractive character because then it's just like that's annoying so he's usually cringy his jokes don't land but it's more of like that's on purpose he usually gets overshadowed by the other characters because that's part of his character you know being overshadowed. <laughs> the printer, or what Twink says, Why is that paper towel dispenser texting us? Has a note for them. And this is what I mean. Twink has good jokes, usually, and I will point them out, but they just they insert themselves into like a very serious conversation or it just breaks up dialogue and it's it doesn't make it run smoothly. Also, Stat still has one of the best jokes so far in the episode. Kill me. Oh, I forgot to tell you, I topped the printer out of fuel. That was gonna be next month's check-in. The group leaves for the day because they're like, hey, we've been doing this every day for the past 10 years. Nothing has changed. If you don't do something soon, Steve, we're gonna have to get real jobs and disband. Steve then gets a gray hair, which is every gay's worst nightmare. And then he gets mad because he still hasn't done anything. Airbnb girl then pops this amazing joke. Oh, 
Is there a lot of anti-LGBTQ discrimination in the world of West Hollywood interior design? So Steve's done waiting. He calls V, who refers to him as Favorite tragic story of wasted potential. He argues with V, you know, why have we gotten a mission? What are you doing? She's the only woman in power though, so it's not really easy for her to get her way. Let alone convince Nicki Minaj's Chun-Li that they deserve a mission. And then we figure out how he recruited the team in the first place. Jab used to be in the Navy, Twink used to be at rock bottom, but now lives in a garage, and Stat used to be in prison. <laughs> they try to find their own mission to do, so Twink has two ideas. He met a guy last night that was suspicious, and his other idea is... Did you guys all know that raisins are grapes? W what was the first one? They're grapes first, and then... The terrorist! And people probably assume Twink is like, an airhead, is stupid, but we find out he's not only good at master disguises, but he somehow knows Kazakh, <laughs> and he can translate the language. Now they have a dilemma. How do you find one white gay in Southern California? Yes, Grinder. In this case, Grindo, because copyright. They eventually find him, so they're gonna go search for him now, but we get more dialogue between V and Chunky, sorry, chun Li. sorry, Nicki Minaj chun Li. And he unofficially names that team Q-Force, derogatory, because They're too soft for active duty? What if somebody sprains their pronoun? V tries to call the group to figure out why they're on a mission, they don't respond. Stat breaks into the suspicious guy's phone, only to find It's a location. So they have a location now, but they need a disguise. So, in comes Twink. Ariana Grande ought to cause quite a stir in the Abbey. The gays love me, and I love them. Shout out to my gay brother Frankie, who is gay! I think TikTok made this go viral, but this is by far the funniest part of the show. I think this was the only joke that made me laugh, which is not a bad thing, because it's hard to make me laugh when I'm alone. We all know this. You don't laugh as much when you're by yourself watching. The voice is correct. The jab at Frankie Grande is funny. I just wish they had another, yeah. So Steve's flirting with our terrorist guy. And by the way, Steve can also speak Kazakh. Like, why does everyone know? He puts a tracker on his back and cue in Ariana Grande to act as a diversion. Can I get a selfie? I'm gay, like your brother. They fight for this USB and they have a car chase and then we find out the car can fly. So they catch him, they go back to the garage and Twink says he announced his new debut song. And V is waiting because she's there to revoke his clearance, which in other words, means sashay away agents oh got it that's bad and they have a reality check they say you know you don't know how hard it is for women like us and people like you to be in the force because they have to work twice as hard to get half as far before steve gives up stat says hey there's some stuff on this drive uh turns out they were about to sell uranium through the black market and they're tied to the government. So V, realizing this is like the biggest thing that's happened to them in a while, they call Chun-Li and she defends Q-Force. She also puts her own job on the line and says, if they ever mess up, you can fire me. Steve then gets a new job as an interior designer and it's actually his headquarters. It's just, you know, it looks like the same office, but behind a painting is the actual headquarters. And this is where he runs into his love interest, Benji. But then Agent Buck comes in for some reason and his orders from Chun-Li Ward. Go babysit the sodomites. So Technically, Buck is their boss now. Why? I don't know. And that's the end of episode one. So, you know, it's a nice introduction to basically every character. You get to know what they're like. On to episode two, Deb's LGBBQ. No, no, it's not called that. <laughs> it's just BBQ. They're supposed to hold on to the USB jar for the time being. So Deb's like, hey, I'm just gonna take some time off then and go to my annual barbecue fest with every lesbian in this community. Apparently, Deb has never invited them to this event because she wants to separate her work life from her personal life, or we should say spy life, because that's even more secret. And obviously her wife doesn't know she's a spy yet. Mary, being the idiot he is, gets bored of waiting and asks Stat to hack the thumb drive so we can get some information for V and make her life easier. Except they mess up and now they have 24 hours before a virus is sent all over the AIA network. Stat tries to fix it for 22 hours straight, before passing out because she couldn't fix it. Benji invites Steve to drinks and he declines. You idiot! Buck has to move into Twink's closet because he needs some office space and Twink has this big closet that has all his wigs, clothing, etc. But he calls Twink a clown and says, you're not a real spy because all you do is play dress up. Stand up straight, Sebastian. You need to build up your muscle. So we see Deb and her wife at the cookout and I just want to clarify, at first in the two videos I made, I said that typically lesbians are portrayed as butch or, you know, more masculine. And then, 
every lesbian from around the world corrected me in the comments. And they said typically in media, it's often like lesbians are just over-sexualized, which makes sense because Kiana told me this and I forgot. They still look feminine for the sake of straight men because, you know, they fetishize lesbians. So at least in Hollywood, lesbians still pass as straight. It's just like, oh, this is for the straight male gaze. So it's actually a nice change to see lesbians being more masculine and not just hypersexualized. Mary gets a call from V who says, I'm gonna be visiting in like an hour, so you better have the thumb drive. Buck is practicing archery on Twink's wigs, specifically, Samantha, no! She is a businesswoman! Giving me more rose energy. Twink ends up locking himself in the closet, sorry, car, because Buck is creating a hostile work environment. So now Steve has to fix the thumb drive virus and and also get Twink out of the closet car. So he goes to Deb because he says Deb is the only one who can fix all of this. She knows everything because she's the mom. She's pissed, rightfully so, because he shows up at the fence. But she says, fine, I'll help you all. So she unlocks the trunk. And then we find out Deb has her own cave to herself with 14 pit bulls. So while Stat's trying to fix the virus, Deb tells them to blend into the barbecue. So she tells Twink and Buck, of all people, to man the grill. And Buck seems to remind Twink of his dad. So in the past, Twink used to be someone who was part of the circus. Also, his original name was Bastion, and he was originally French, but he has a traumatic past because of course he does. Steve makes the best joke about Capricorns. She's constantly talking about how good you are at working with underserved communities like troubled children and Capricorn. My boyfriend is also one. Deb meets Steve for the first time and says, you're a great guy, you know, you deserve a relationship. Insert lesbian joke. Deb and I merged our bank accounts on our first date. And what I love about this scene is that you get to see literally all the different varieties of lesbians. I mean, they, they mention it in the show too. You even see ones looking for donors. Could Maddie and I get some of your sperm? No. So Twink is now like upset to show himself in public and express his true self. It's just an analogy to how like people like Buck make queer people feel uncomfortable to be themselves in public. Hence why usually it's like you're more yourself online or at home, but in, in school or with your parents, you're more toned down. But the woman insists that Twink shouldn't let Buck get to his head. So he's like, yeah, you're right. Um, I'm gonna be my true self. Let's limbo. And he means limbo. Lower? No, like, lower. V also surprises them, even though Deb's house uses the same location masking shields as Wakanda. V creates her own persona of why she's there, and she gets to judge the coleslaw fest. Yes, I said coleslaw. It's just that's how I said it in Charleston. Coleslaw, like, ugh, ugh. But she has to draw out the event because Steve is still trying to fix the problem. So she says, "Oh my God." All these different flavors of coleslaw. You see the variety of the. It's a joke about lesbians. Coleslaw can come in all different shapes, sizes, colors. The coleslaw literally becomes an analogy to lesbians. Stats almost done hacking, but she has to get through this like trivia, and it involves construction, winter sports, bee sustainability. Sound familiar? Yeah, the lesbians end up helping because in this show they're more sustainable and they know everything about Women's Olympics. It was entertaining to see a trivia game, but like, come on. This film, Carol! And then V answers the last question. What would the correct ignition timing be on a 1955 Bel Air Chevrolet with a 327 cubic inch engine and a four barrel carburetor? It's a trick question because Chevy didn't make a 327 in 55. The 327 didn't come out till 63. And it wasn't offered in the Bel Air with a four barrel car till 64. However, in 1964, the correct ignition timing would be four degrees before top dead set. Which makes you think, are you, is she? She's not, actually. Well, I'll let you think about it. Twink gets into Steve's costume, which... I thought you'd be Twink. Well, I'm not Twink. How? V also gives Q-Force their first mission. And then Steve, feeling bad for Benji, stops by his house. You know, they have wine, and then they, they do the nasty. I don't know why I did this. They don't really show the scene, um, but they show another one in the future. <laughs> Episode three, Backache Mountain. The team has to figure out what's going on at a uranium mine in Wyoming, and they get their own private jet. Twink is literally cosplaying as Britney Spears and is also a literal skinny queen. Welcome to Twink Air, where the only thing thinner than the air is me. So their mission is to plug the uranium hole which is easy for tops, don't quote me, V said that. And everyone gives a double take to Twink when he says, I'm a femme top with a gun. Look at Twink breaking every bottom stereotype. The team goes undercover as two straight men and then a news team to find out more information about the town. Stat is camera, Deb is sound, and Twink is the most famous reporter of all time. Aaron Brockovich from the movie Aaron Brockovich. This is also Steve's best attempt at a straight voice. Where are the other miners? Where are the other miners? So there's only one guy in the mine. Buck 
almost kills him because he's like, he's the bad guy, he has to be. But Steve figures out that Ennis, the minor, is gay because he has three Sex in the City movies on the shelf and also a bunch of other signs. Bollywood version of Shania Twain's Up album. What about this sexy lady? That's a young Sheila Ward and is a poster promoting literacy. Also, what is this? Why does everyone have a gun in Wyoming? <laughs> Why is there an RPG coming out of her vagin? So they try to seduce Ennis and Buck is like, come in the water with me. Oh wait, this is radioactive waste. So he's now in quarantine because they have to wash it all off, but I think he would have died. No, because like, I've seen Adventure Time. I know what happens. And this is where that Citibank joke comes in. You can't pander to the gays, they can smell it. They're acting like Citibank at Pride. I want to remind everyone, it's not a accurate joke. Like if you just said Target or anyone else, it would have made sense, but Citibank does a lot at Pride, so yeah, it's confusing. And this is where I can do anything else for you, just let me know. Literally. You ever wonder how deep the shaft goes? Cringe. So the private company bought out the mine. So all the workers are upset about it. So they want to get revenge by blowing it up. And this and Steve eventually do the nasty. And this is where that, they, it's, it shows a lot more. There's a lot more booty in there. A lot more leg, thigh, gap. <laughs> some people might be like, why are there so many sex scenes? Like why, why are they always showing gay guys naked? They're not. I think some people are just accustomed to seeing straight people being naked so that the moment you see two gay people, it's like, oh, this is uncomfortable. And keep in mind, this is an adult show. Like the curse words are out the wazoo. The jokes sometimes are for older people because they reference things before I was even born. But if you have those feelings about like being uncomfortable by seeing it, just, just assess why. You know, double check yourself if it was a straight couple doing it. And also they don't even like fetishize it that like Hollywood usually does. You know, when high schoolers are somehow having sex and they zoom in on every inch of their body. Yeah, they don't do that. It's cartoon. But Steve finds out that the robots are actually the ones stealing the uranium. And also that mountain is about to blow up because of the workers. So Steve now has to save Buck who's still in quarantine. Twink makes a Sean Cody joke, if you know, you know. And then Steve makes this empowering speech about Q-Force only for Deb to rightfully shut him up. Pride, chosen family, we get it, the bombs! So Steve saves Ennis and Buck. Twink lassos a robot head, you know, BDSM style. <laughs> and the episode ends with Ennis trying to marry Mary, get it? And he obviously declines and then inserts funny joke. So why did we fight for the ride? We did so much damn marching! And I think I finally get why V has a soft spot for Steve is because she no longer is on the field. Like she is in headquarters all the time. So seeing them live their life with, you know, the action and being in the adrenaline rush makes her like live vicariously. Steve points out they're the first queer Asians on the field and Deb says, try being a black woman for five seconds. Only for Steve to say, Oh my God, I would love to, but wouldn't I get in trouble? Anyway. At least they're aware, <laughs> you know? And if you don't understand the joke, uh, just watch T Noir, I'll link it. In short, don't say you're trying to channel your inner black woman ever. Just no, shh. Deb finally goes home. She's excited to see Pam, but we find out someone broke in and Pam's gone. And they say, if you don't hand over the uranium, Deb dies. This is actually juicy now like my ass. On to episode four. Steve has no self-awareness at all. The coordinates in Pam's ransom note. Ransom note, oh my God. The coordinates in the ransom note. Stop, Stop saying, saying ransom, ransom note. note. They found the coordinates to where they have to get the uranium to and it's at Europe Vision. And I said Europe, not Euro, because copyright. This is where I kind of have a problem with the plot because it's like, why are these things in there? You know, why is it Europe Vision? Why are they in Genorvia? It's literally a reference to Genovia. <laughs> it starts to get a little confusing after this point, which is why I prefer the first two episodes. They get there, Deb goes full on give me my wife mode. And she's also in a dress and she clearly hates it. But everyone looks good though, they look sharp. I'm supposed to swallow this big thing? <laughs> What is this, my audition for Teen Wolf? So they're just waiting around, Deb's drinking her feelings away, and Steve asks her to dance with her. And then we get introduced to another character, Mira Poly... Poly... Polyamorous, I don't know. Princess of Genorvia, though. Sound familiar? <laughs> yes, for anyone who never watched Princess Diaries with Anne Hathaway, this is literally the Princess Diaries, the same storyline, except it's Genorvia. And it's almost the same name as the actual princess, Mia Thermopolis. But apparently she knows V, so she's on their side. And also just listen to her origin story, like, it all started a long time ago when I was a teen and looked a fucked. My single mother told me the royal palace of Genorvia contacted her. My father, who was in line for the throne, had died. So I got a blowout, Loki got on Accutane and came here. How did you get away with that? <laughs> how is this not copyright? I want to know. So V used to be her security guard, which is how they know each other. And then we get introduced to this girl named Vox Tux, who is apparently like the biggest singer for Genorvia and her attitude. 
go away, you gay boy. We don't stand. So Twink goes back and forth with Vox Tux and says, you're not even a good singer. You can't even hit the H note, which is like some really high note. And then Vox is like, watch me. So she, ah, and then um, blows up. Like literally she died. You see what I mean when I say like some of the stuff gets confusing, like why? What's the purpose of Vox Tux? Why did she blow up? Who is Mira? Why are they in Genorvia? Where, where's the uranium? It's a lot of names to remember. So Stat takes out the robot they initially got last episode and it's now sentient. It's a, it can talk and know things. And she names it Jacqueline Box which is Jack in the Box. Now at this point, you know, I'm watching, I've already watched the whole show and everyone was like, oh, is Stat's secret going to be that she's trans or asexual? Because two things can happen. First of all, we shouldn't say being trans is a secret. We're not gonna do something like Nikki tutorials and bash her for hiding. There's no hiding, okay? It's their business, not yours, not the news, not anyone's. So it shouldn't be seen as a secret or like some thing they had to hide from you. Spoiler alert, I don't know the secret still. There's no indication that she has one. They don't even mention her being like another sexuality, nothing like that. She's a hacker, right? She likes coding. So her most romantic relationship is with this robot. So Europe Vision starts and we see Miss Arianka Elsa letting it go. Buck and Mira are doing the nasty and kick Stat out. Pervert. Which if she was asexual, that's a very good joke. And then Jacqueline Box, because she can do anything, she finds out that the song lyrics performed at Europe Vision contain coded references to illegal goods trafficked through Europe. And I just want to say one of the lyrics is nuke my ass, daddy, nuke my ass. And uh, I think TikTok needs to take that off. We need that audio, please. They see that Vonda is co-hosting and it's obvious that it's Pam. Yes, we know it's Pam with makeup on and a wig. So Deb saves Pam and then she quits because she's like, my wife was in danger. We almost died, so we're going home. And while she's going home, Steve gets knocked unconscious. And then Stat finds out that Europe Vision is just a big black market auction for weapons. And the songs are what they're selling. So for example, Uranium's Got a Friend in Me was changed to Intelligent Man. Pam is way too excited about the spy thing. She's like, go on, save Steve. You deserve to, I'll understand. We'll just go to therapy. No, if Joey was a spy, goodbye. Nope. You know, I'm probably gonna die anyways if I leave him. So Steve is tied up, not in the good way, and he's the next thing that's gonna be auctioned off because it's the most valuable product they have. A gay white dude. <laughs> and once again, Jacqueline knows everything. So she's like, according to what I just found out by going through circuits or whatever, your vision runs on one power grid and all you need is a really high pitch to break the circuits and then he'll be free or something. It's confusing to follow because I'm pausing like every 10 seconds to write stuff down and I still get confused. So Twink needs to belt the H note, but it risks him dying. And Anne Hathaway is still doing the nasty with Buck until Stack comes back and says, Yes, period queen. Go work, hunty mama. Slay boots the house down, sissy squat. Why did I write this down? <laughs> yes, Twink, woo! So he's dead. Mary gets freed from Twink's moan. <laughs> why, did I, why did I write this? And he kills the purple people eater, which I didn't expect the show to get as graphic as that. Like the, you see the bullet go through his head and blood comes out like, for a cartoon, that's pretty graphic, but I'm here for it. Also, Twink is alive. He was just in the sky. V comes back again to congratulate them. Do you see what I mean? Like somehow V inserts herself into every episode. She did it at Deb's and now she's doing it here and she's gonna do it in every episode. You'll see. From this hashtag girl boss and- Oh, no, not the girl boss. At least she's an ally. And this is where we get the next plot. So Mira asks V, how's her partner doing? And V's like, who, what? Oh, you don't remember. Let's show you a picture. You, oh. Even with a picture, you still have no memory of them? Cliffhanger. So I'm convinced V is actually a lesbian, but no, it's, it's her partner in crime. Episode five, this is where they're at the drag bar, which is an exact replica of, I think, it's, I think it's called Mary's in LA. Either way, they gave no credit to the bar. They didn't pay them, no commissions. Also, there's this drag queen in the cartoon that is an exact replica of an actual drag queen that works there. Hey, Twink. Oh, hey, girl. That's my job, daddy. There's a whole controversy. Mayhem Miller talked about it on Twitter. I'm not gonna repeat myself. Finally, Steve and Benji are officially dating. So they're meeting Benji's friends and Steve's like, oh, actually I've been invited to this party for this guy I used to know a long time ago named Chastin. Chastin looks exactly like the living Ken doll guy, but he needs help from Steve. He says, my assistant, Patrick number five is missing. V is confused about her partner still, but she's consulting Pam and Deb right now because right 
at this point, Pam is a liability. If she can't handle the fact that Deb is a spy, they both have to leave. But Pam is also a child psychologist and asks V. You got a partner, V? Why the fuck would you ask me about my partner? What do you know? I, I just meant, are you single? Stat hacks into Patrick number five's phone and figures out his last text was going to an audition, see you later, never came back. She also blushes when Jacqueline Box asks her to show her around West Hollywood. So this isn't an official case yet. Steve wants to find out more. So he goes to the sheriff in this area and says, hey, I want to file a report for missing Patrick number five. And it's very suspicious because the sheriff says we can't do anything. So the detective strolls him out and we find out that Steve's car gets towed. But don't worry, you can use one of the gay scooters, which is literally city bike. It's called a scoot loop and gays get it for one mile free. Is this a jab at Citibank? Because Citibank also owns City Bike, which is like gay scoop loop. Probably. I personally love City Bike though. I use it every day for school, so sponsor me, please. This is also very clear on what's happening. Literally, the scooters are used to prey on the gays and then they get kidnapped. So while Steve's outside, he meets Toluca Lake, which is this very big tits blonde, and she was actually Patrick's roommate. It's very convenient. Right? Apparently, Patrick is the third gay guy to go missing after going to a secret rave party. Pam has to go through a bunch of tests to prove that she can handle Deb being a spy. She aces all of them. And then V gets very emotional about Karen. I mean, Pam. I mean, Promise me, you'll never take Karen for granted. I mean, Pam! Stats taking Jacqueline on a ride, and we find out that Jacqueline, once again, has uber powers. She can turn on the stoplight. She can make ATMs go crazy. And while they're riding on a bike, some Scoot Loop guy goes past and stats like, hey, mess with him. But she can't. Turns out Scoot Loop app has military grade encryption and is also owned by the detective. <laughs> Mary meets up with some gay boy that he met at the Cheston party. I, don't, I forgot his name. I think it was Anthony or something because he wanted to be named after the famous gay guy in Queer Eye. And he tells them, hey, there's this party that's going on tonight. Here's the address. Gay boy tries to leave on a scoot loop and his trial runs out. So Steve's like, hey, use mine. And while gay boy's going away, um, hello? <laughs> <gasps> Excuse me? So Steve was supposed to die then, but gay boy got killed. This is a hate crime. The last test for Pam is to be shot in the chest with a bulletproof vest. So V tries to do it, but she can't pick up a gun. And we learned that ever since V has left the field, she hasn't been able to touch any weapon in general. Also, this happens like in between each scene. It goes, gay boy dies, V freezes up, Mary still has gay boy's phone and figures out the location of the next party back to Pam and V. Like, it, why? It skips like this. And I know that's the reason it gets confusing. Also, V's partner was, their name was Karen? Really? So Pam says, hey, I can get your memory back because if you, you know, massage the back and you hit a certain point, it can jog your memory or something. Let me see if that works. Nope. No memory. Not yet. Nothing's happening. But V tells her to walk on me, Pamela. So Steve goes to the party with Twink and Buck and it's a police and pigs part. Don't get me started on the theme. <laughs> Twink sees that the small gays in the pool are being sucked into a big hole. Yes, I said that. Yep, I said that right there. Did I really just? Yeah, I wrote that in the script. Oh my God. But this part. I'm a stunning icon in flight. Amelia Earhart, eat your ass out. Twink is my favorite character. I, well, yeah, I think he's my favorite character. I'm gonna try to explain this. So the sheriff department is stealing young gays at parties in order to use them for acting. They make them act until they die because they pump them with some drugs to keep them awake. And then they use those scenes for a streaming platform, which is how they get so much money. <laughs> Very clear on this plot, but yeah, they, they're just acting as gay superheroes basically and then they drop dead gorgeous going back to V yes we're still going back and forth she gets a flashback and she knew that she used to be partners with Karen they used to do jobs together as agents but her final memory was seeing Dirk Chunley and this other operator slicing her brain in order to wipe her memory like they said if we slice into this part she'll never remember Karen also the stereotype that NYU always gets mentioned in any show it happened don't send me back there it's much worse. At least here, I, I got to use my degree from, from NYU. And apparently, Chaston is a bad guy, and Toluca is back. It's like every episode, there's another plot. Like, what happened to Genorvio? Stat also says, hey, I know Chaston. He's been wanting to recruit me as a hacker for years. Aw, goodbye, gay boy. I'm sorry, this is so wrong of me. Also, Stat is into the robot like sexually now. And this is apparently Jacqueline's form. Like, you know, when a gem in Steven Universe has their own form, this is Jacqueline's form. 
digitally. Yes, they have virtual, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And at this point, I'm like, is this her secret that she's into digital demon sex? No, not the secret either. Episode six, Twink, Stat, and Buck are gonna go undercover to try to figure out more about Chaston's company while Deb and Mary go to Intellicon. The orca from Blackfish? That was a good joke. If you don't know, Tilicum is the orca from Blackfish. But Intellicon is just like the spy event of the year. It's like Coachella for spies. <laughs> also, it took me six episodes to realize the dash in Q-Force is a bullet. Wow. Like... <laughs> At Intellicon, Steve meets Greg, his old roommate. These characters all matter, by the way. You're gonna have to memorize all these names. Also, this is a TikTok couple. A dark goth and pastel goth right here, but they're trying to be hackers. And Chaston's company is called Honestly? With a question mark, yep. Toluca is also business partners with Chaston. And Honestly is an all-natural skincare line, and they have secret ingredients that make your skin just look glowy. And you know my opinion on clean skincare. It's freaking stupid. Everything has chemicals in it. Even water. This is another topic, though. So they go into the hacker office, and this is the first time staff feels included because because it's like, hey, I'm with all my hacker friends, and oh my god, you have Mountain Dew. And she also likes them because they all watch this show called Hobblestones, and it's like a nun show. I don't know why, but it is relevant in this, okay? It comes back in at least three more episodes. So just know, Cobblestones is a show that Stat really likes, but no one else understands. And Twink, being the versatile queen he is, is like, hey, we need to do stuff, like we have to hack into this thing. Going back to Intellicon, we're gonna flip flop again. V is asking Deb and Steve for a favor. She says, I wanna figure out why I don't know Karen. And the only place that has her files is in the office where Dirk Chunley is. So they climb up a building and this is where we find out that joke from the trailer, don't get me hard right now from Deb. Maybe next year we'll have a booth at Intellicon. Don't get me hard right now. Yeah, it, it makes sense now. Why would you put that in the trailer? Like it doesn't, the jokes in the trailer suck because <laughs> it's all out of context. So they're spying on the AIA and apparently Karen's info has been erased from everywhere, but the only physical file of her information is in Dirk Chunley's office. And today is also something called the secretary's ball where every Asian just, you know, it's like prom for spies. <laughs> so the office will be empty at some point because Dirk Chunley's assistant leaves eventually. So that's their chance to get in. Even I'm seeing it right now, it's like, I can't keep up. Twink and Stat figure out that Honestly hires their hackers in order to keep their secret ingredients secret because Krabby Patty secret formula. So Twink goes on Stat's laptop to find out more and he gets introduced to Jacqueline and officially they're girlfriends. But Jacqueline's a little jealous because Stat's hanging out with other people. Steve goes to the ball, even though he's told not to because you need to concentrate on getting this information instead of partying with, you know, other spies and trying to fit in. What was this? What's this claw? Fit in. Twink is doing his plankton moment, girl bossing his way, trying to figure out the Krabby Patty secret formula, and then Stat is talking to Jacqueline, but then Toluca sees her, and she's like, hey, you're not here to be with us, you're here to hack. Steve finds out that Luis, who is the secretary in the office, is coming back already, so they have to hurry up. And everyone starts fighting in the office. We're gonna cut now to what's happening with Twink because it literally happens in the show. The secret ingredient is young men, and they, in short, get cold pressed into something called jock oil. <laughs> Little morbid, but either way, Jacqueline saves them, but in the process of saving the gay, she dies because uh, the explosion killed her as a computer. I don't know, can AI die? Going back to V, because we're still flip-flopping, she overcomes her PTSD and is able to pick up a gun and tells Chun-Li, I wanna know the truth about Karen. And he plays a tape. Apparently, she killed Karen, but it doesn't make sense to her. But now Chun-Li's like, you're in breach of, you know, betraying the AI. AIA, you're also endangering the top leader, so you need to be arrested. V's not having it, she's like, peace, see you later, jumps out the window, runs away. On to episode seven, Tarzana. Steve has to go to the funeral for gay boy Antony because um, you killed him, but he was also Benji's friend. Benji and Steve also finally say I love you to each other, yay. And Buck's been a dick to all of them the entire time, so they wanted to play a prank on him by having Twink dress up as Mira and say, hey, hey babes, I'm coming to LA, I can't wait to see you, mwah. I want you to come come with my bum bum and then Buck's like oh yes of course. Steve and Benji go to Tarzana which is where Benji originally was from and it's just like this peaceful area. They meet Benji's parents. Buck is going on a date with Twink slash Mira and he actually shows more kindness for once. He's like being normal and just 
treating it like a regular date. Steve's at a karaoke bar with his friends and Benji, but then while he's singing, which I'm not gonna play, it's cringe, uh, V shows up. Count how many times she's shown up spontaneously. Three times now? She thinks she's part of a conspiracy because she knows she's not a cold-blooded killer and wants to find out more about Karen. In her new disguise is Steve's mother, Vivian, and tells Steve, you need to shoot me in the back so I can remember my memory. <laughs> okay, I get you on your back blown out. That's cool, but... Let's not do it literally. Going back to Buck, he takes Mira to their apartment and we see a bunch of stuffed animals and they're like, hey, what's what's up with the plushies? And we find out Buck used to be an orphan and he was always tossed around from family to family. So that's why he gets a bunch of plushies, but he never really had parents. So that's why he, uh, he's crying. Oh. Oh, this is happening. And then Buck sends an email to the AIA saying, I'm quitting because I want to be the Prince of Genovia with you. Will you marry me? Sorry, I'm twink. It's like a James Charles fantasy. Let me stop. <laughs> no slander today, Frederick. Steve makes V go away because he's like, you are interrupting my family time with Benji and I'm about to go to a funeral. Go away. She leaves. They go to the funeral. And at the funeral, Greg is in the back. Remember Steve's roommate that I said would be mentioned again and it will be mentioned a third time later They're fighting Greg's about to kill him until V comes out of nowhere fourth time man Like let's stop this she takes the bullet and remembers this thing called grayscale Greg's like haha She took the bullet for you. You're both gonna die, but no Karen comes in Karen. Yes, she's alive swoops in takes V and runs away at this point I am I'm genuinely confused. Q4s apologize to Buck and they have a heart to heart. And at this point, Buck is sympathetic now. He understands Q4s. Q4s understands Buck more, so he's not as much of a dick. But it's just, it felt rushed this whole episode because in the same episode, Steve breaks up with Benji. You idiot, like we were rooting for you. I'm saving you, save yourself. You don't want to be with me. Uh, shut up. We know you're going to get back together. Episode 8, Grayscale. So, Grayscale is this file created by someone named Dr. Hammond who used to work with the AIA but now is not. Also in this show, Instagram is Insta- BAM! Today is also Twink's birthday and no one remembers, so there's gonna be a fit soon. Steve runs into Buck, who is having a conversation with Dirk Chunli in the toilet stall, and Chunli says, you're supposed to be managing Q-Force better. How are you letting them do all of this? Until further notice, you're suspended. Dirk also says, and I quote, you're too focused on Janorvian Poontang. <laughs> And ever since Buck cried to Q-Force and opened up, he seems like a teddy bear now. Literally, he's a bear, but also he's so soft. Like he's crying in front of Steve and now he's like, I'm not homophobic anymore. Like I'm not gonna insult you all. It's just in one episode, he's a stuffed animal, but only the stuffing now. <laughs> Everything is out. The team goes to spy on Dirk Hammond and they see that he's a podiatrist who is helping patients right now. But then Twink's like, hey, this is actually a secret mission. Y'all forgot, I'm gonna run away. And he does. Hammond seems to inject something into one of his clients and we see that he's like holding up papers and says, do you remember this? No. Do you remember this? No. But that client is also very agile and can do this stuff. Like, so is that super juice? Is it steroids? Deb refers to him as Want Simone Biles? And while they're spying, this woman comes from behind them and is like, oh my God, Dr. Hammond's a miracle worker. He gave me these pills and now I'm so much better. This neighborhood is great. So like, okay, they're all zombies. It's the insertion, you know, like every plot point gets it's like steven universe again <laughs> and also steve is not over benji at all don't tell benji i called him handsome wait shit benji and i broke up but we kind of had to break up oh that's so sad also benji wouldn't have cared he was so chill mary dude he also runs into sexy king triton the client and they bond over carrots phallic i see but he invites steve to a dinner party later today with all the other neighbors twink goes to a drag bar with stat to try to you know have more fun for his birthday and this is where he says his famous line. Wow. He expected a young drag queen, but it's this old queen instead. And I thought this would be like some mini arc about Twink not being ready to age because it's like, oh, I'm still young. Like I'm gonna be like this old queen one day. Nope, they don't build off of it at all. Going back to the party, Steve is talking to some guys and we see that they can talk very robotically. They're also very good at shooting darts. Like they shoot a bullseye and then another bullseye on it. So they either have superpowers or oh, they're agents maybe. And my assumption was correct. They are ex-gay agents who had their mind wiped at some point which is probably grayscale because, you know, a rainbow, gay, grayscale, not gay. It's like companies after Pride Month. 
so Steve is talking to sexy Dilf Triton and figures out he has a back brace on his back and is like, oh, they don't want your backs to be touched with, huh? So he tries giving Triton, his name is Andrew, his memories back and it jolts like a little bit of a memory. Stad and Twink find out where Dr. Hammond actually lives, so they go to his house to try to find out more about Grayscale, but Dr. Hammond is there and he's like, you'll never figure it out. So he grabs a suitcase and runs away. But before he runs away, Twink unleashes his French kid powers and walks on a rope and like gives him the death drop. Literally. So they find out in the briefcase that Grayscale wasn't just to wipe memories, it was to make anyone who didn't fit in, fit in. So actual conversion therapy. There's a lot of homophobia for a show called Q-Force. So they go back to the neighborhood and they get their memories back and they're like, oh my god, we used to be gay! But then the AIA shows up and the old Q-Force defends the new Q-Force so they can get away. While they're running away, V and Karen show up because of course she does, fifth time entering in a random area. V's like, yes, you figured it out, but in the way that she knew they would figure it out from the start. And before the episode ends, V tells Steve they need to talk about Karen. Episode 9, The Cœur de la Mer. Why is the word the in there instead of le? I don't know, but it is. So, it stands for Heart of the Sea, you'll find out why. And they also refer to it as The Cœur. French people, now is your time to be offended. The episode starts with a flashback between V and Karen and we find out that they had a plan to stop the AIA a long time ago before that she got killed. Their plan was for V to fake kill Karen. She would go in hiding for a year because V would then be praised. I guess Karen was a bad person in the AIA. Either way, V was supposed to go up in the ranks and then be able to stop the AIA at the top. But the plan backfired because she got her memory wiped by Gary Scales. So he actually had to wait 10 years to reunite with Karen instead of one. And Karen waited those 10 years too. So the cur, the cur de la mer, is uh, the agent's secret location. Like it's the bunker in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean that has the top secret information of all time. So it's where the grayscale information is hidden and also everything else. And they need to find out the locations of all the grayscaled agents. Yes, grayscaled is now a verb. But the reason why V is worried about Karen is because since she hates the AIA so much and had to live in the wilderness for 10 years in hiding, she kind of went insane. She's like, um, I want to throw an atomic bomb on them. And V's like, maybe not that. This is how crazy Karen was. She thought that V was there with her the whole time. She's like, you'll, you'll come back, you know? A little bit of a one-sided relationship, I'd say. Either way, the map to the core is um, in the plushy thing. V rips it open. My gloss went away, didn't it? Oh my god, so sad. Yeah. <laughs> Why did you say it like that? There we go. Mm. Buck is officially dating Miro. And I'm just gonna play this. She loves the LGBTQ community. That's why she's hosting World Pride. Karen ends up in the jet somehow. She was hiding in where the suitcases are. So they land on this abandoned island where apparently the Kurt is. And Deb says she used to be on Survivor. So she knows her way around things that can find it. So she takes off her shirt, goes on full on titty mode. Once again, naked people are normal in this show. If you don't want it, don't watch it. I also can't put any clips of it. Chun Li somehow shows up and instead of wanting to fight, he says, let's negotiate. He's also with his secretary. What was their name? I'm gonna call them desk. He says grayscale was something from a long time ago. It's in the past. It's not part of the agency anymore. So you know, you don't need to go uncover it basically. And if you let this go, you can have anything you want, Steve. You want an invisible drone? Sure. You want to be head of the Q4? Sure. You want to be at the top? You want to have everything you want? Have it. Just don't go to the curve. Steve's not having it. He says, fuck your drag. They force Chun-Li to lead them to the Kerr, and it's just it's literally a big heart in the center of a mountain. And turns out they're hiding a, a lot of baggage, like everything you ever could think of. What did you expect? They went past mind control. They wanted to go even further to doing it onto citizens. So there's a lot of information there and V's had enough of it. And he says, you know what, Karen, let's do your plan. Let's blow it up. So they throw a grenade at the heart and it blows up. That means all communication on the AIA is down. So picture not having Wi-Fi. <laughs> also, you're telling me that the defense system was robots, but you couldn't even get the budget to make them bulletproof. Chunky's assistant decides to help now because she says, I never knew the AIA was so homophobic until today. I know this is shocking, but I'm gay. I still don't know her name. I've I said it before in this video though. But do you see what I mean? Like there's so many names you just don't remember anymore because they don't have enough relevancy for you to want to remember their name. They almost escape but they realize Mia betrays them because initially Buck was supposed to man the jet because they were going to forward the information to the jet later. However, Mira gave them the jet in the first place so she can control where it goes. So basically, she has on the information now and she's gonna use it to blackmail everyone at the next Pride event, which is called World Pride in Genorpia. So now it's the gays, the AIA, Chun-Li, all against Mira. 
hashtag girl boss. On to the final episode, the hole. Yes, it's called the hole. Why? Because uh, there's just a big hole in Genorvia apparently, and they always reference it. Don't ask. Don't ask, don't tell. They need backup, obviously, because World Pride is apparently the biggest Pride event of the year, so there's gonna be a lot of security there, and they're gonna need more hands. So they start ungrayscaling the past agents by playing a secret kill code, which is Deborah Winger <laughs> has been in enough movies. Another one of those examples of this audience is not intended to be Gen Z or younger because you're most likely not going to know who this person is. Thankfully, I learned who Deborah Winger was through film classes. So in short, she's iconic. She's been in a lot of films. The gays love her. If I were to youthify is that a verb? That phrase for y'all to understand? It'd probably be like, Jenna Marbles is overrated. No one can never say that. No one. Ever. So the big Pride Fest we saw initially is World Pride. It's the finale. There's a bunch of Pride parades. Nero's at the front. Her whole plan is basically, I'm going to make a gay zombie army. She has these hats that she wants them to put on, which are plankton hats basically in the original spongebob movie you know what i mean so she wants to control the gays i guess i don't know like where this comes from that was not in princess diaries so q4 storms into mia's palace but no one's there wasted all that masculinity on nothing not nothing my little butthole went boop. still cringe Still cringe. Mira announces she's gonna get married to Buck, who is hypnotized by the pride hat. To the companies out there, this is what happens when you capitalize off of pride. This. Zombies. Don't do it. So I mentioned Cobblestones, the show earlier, right? The nun show that only Stab mentioned. Apparently, this entire season revolves around the show. According to Stat, Genorvia eats up this show. It's like Grey's Anatomy of Genorvia. And it's so referential that in the show, they reference a royal wedding. So. We're now watching that episode of Cobblestones to figure out what Mira's gonna do. I'm gonna try to explain this as best I can. In the show, the only way to stop a royal wedding is with the Horn of Objection or something. So they have to go find the Horn of Objection. Where is it? It's where they used to store the show equipment, which is at the bottom of the... It's like the underground palace or something. So Steve and Stat go find the Horn of Objection. Also, Benji is there. Why? Benji says, Ugh, everywhere I go, you're here, Steve. Why? Yeah, my friends dragged me to Pride. It's so crowded and loud. Out, and now my hiding spot is full of you. Bad dialogue, basically. So then they're going to the pride parade. They're trying to stop the wedding. The gays start fighting with the other zombified gays. But one of the officers destroys the horn of ejection. So technically you can't stop the wedding now. So how do you stop it? With a diversion. Insert twink dressed as Mira. So it's like, I'm the real Mira. No, I am. No, I am. Buck ends up marrying twink and Miro's plan gets stopped. They celebrate saving the world, and the last scene is Steve reintroducing himself to Benji as Mary, Agent Mary. So let's recap. This is my conclusion to this essay that's been going on. Is the show good? Sure, I give it like a, a six and a half out of 10 from any show I've seen. We all thought going into this, like it would just be incredible stereotypes and they are. It's weird because it's like, they don't even have the time to mention the stereotypes because it's 20 minutes long, 10 episodes. You have so many things happening in the plot. It's like the jokes don't even matter about the who they are. It wasn't that the jokes were stereotypical. It's that there were so many at some point, they were all bad. I distinctly remember Deb has better jokes than Twink. However, the amount of jokes she says is nothing compared to him. Every conversation that happens, if Twink is in that scene, he will say something eventually to try to add comedic effect. But when you do that every time, it doesn't work anymore. And I get it's adult comedy. It's supposed to be stereotypical. That's just how adult comedy works nowadays. But I still don't think that's an excuse for bad writing because shows can focus on comedy and also have a good plot. I mean, take Schitt's Creek and The Good Place. They don't have an insane amount of episodes each season. You can follow it because it flows well. It's focused on comedy. And they're also 20 minutes long too, so it's that's not an excuse, you know, in terms of the cartoon. And in general, watching the show felt very confusing because I was going in between two scenes, like, oh, Stat and Twink are doing something, but then this team is doing something, but we're going back and forth, every sentence is a different scene. And if you were listening along, you might have felt that way because you're like, Frederick, why are you going back and forth? I just laid it out the way the show did. I didn't reorganize in any way. So if you felt confused just from reading my synopsis, then you will be as confused watching the show. So I guess to the writers, we don't have to flip-flop each scene. Have a scene conclude before you move on to the next one. There's a lot of fight scenes, and even in the midst of it, we go between the fight and another thing happening in the same episode. Just focus on one thing, finish the fight, move on to the next scene. And especially, like, I don't know why it happens, when they're fighting, 
they're still talking to each other. It's like, Mary, we need you to do this. Oh, but V, I don't want to. And it's like they're kicking ass, but they're standing there while fighting. It's disorientating. Not saying you need incredible fight scenes. Like, not asking for that. I'm just saying it's confusing. And it's not just me that feels that way. I looked at the reviews. It's like 77% of people on Google enjoyed it. It has a six point something rating on IMDb and a 25% on Rotten Tomatoes. Do those justify the quality of the show? No. But usually you go to those reviews to be like, hmm, how will the general audience react? And let's just say it's mixed, overall positive, because it's not a bad show. I enjoyed it watching. I actually really liked the first three episodes because it felt like there was a natural flow. You know, you get introduced to the characters in the beginning, you understand everyone's backstory. It's, it's not hard to follow that one. Episode two is about Deb's barbecue. That was a nice episode. It's only when you start putting in stats, romance with the Jacqueline box, which didn't have any relevancy, I feel like, in the end. You add in Mira from Genorvia, which is somehow also tied to Eurovision, which also we're now gonna be talking about uranium mines, and that didn't go anywhere either. I initially thought the whole show would just be about the uranium mine. No, it doesn't even come up anymore. It goes from that to them going to the mine, then talking about Genorvia, Eurovision, Miro, oh, now we're gonna talk about Grayscale, Dr. Hammond dies, back to Miro, it's kind of like how my grades looked in high school, you know, it's very this. In terms of the humor, eh, not everyone's gonna like it. I laughed once at the Ariana Grande one, which I, when I laugh out loud by myself, because Joey did not want to watch me, it does show a lot about the show. It means it's, it has good humor. Problem is they rely on Twink, and when you only rely on one character, it kind of just makes them bad at humor. That's like saying David from Shit's Creek be the one who had good jokes. No, they all had equally good jokes. So I just wish more characters could have those good lines instead. And I, I, this has been debated a lot before. I don't think we need to have homophobia in a show anymore for it to be queer. Some people say it's too positive when there is no homophobia in a show that involves gay people. Why do you think that media has to show queer pain in order for it to be queer. Tina Waters also made a video about this, great one. It's not required anymore. I can honestly understand like why you would think that back then. We get surprised when we see someone's parents are fully accepting from the beginning. Going back to Schitt's Creek, Dan Levy and Eugene, they specifically said, I didn't want any homophobia because there is no reason to have it there. Seeing good relationships between queer people or just seeing queer people in general does not require homophobia through straight people. I've even seen critiques of people saying like, ugh, I hate that their relationship is so positive and they didn't have to experience any homophobia. What does that mean? At that point, you're just pushing your own insecurities. It's like, oh, I felt that growing up, so you have to in media because it's not fair. Being someone who's dealt with it, first-hand experience with parents, I don't need to relive it. So for a show that's all about Q4s and focuses on showing queer agents being their best selves, that's at least what the producer intended for, I think we can emphasize the positivity of queerness more in the show. There's not as many like badass fight scenes as I thought there would be. It's more dialogue between characters instead. And it doesn't even revolve around Q-Force. It's all about V and then it's about Buck. I kind of wish they had their own episode. Like, you know how Deb had one? I wish Twink had their own. We only have a second of it though, so there is no character building. Not that it's required, but it's always nice. And there are many comedy shows that can do that, even in a small span of, you know, 10 episodes and the short, episode length. I'm not mad that they couldn't develop every character. I'm like, I get it. You had a plot to deal with and you needed jokes first before focusing on each character and giving them their own arc. But it just felt a little rushed. It was like so much was happening in each episode. It couldn't even develop any plot. And I think it's because they had so many ideas and they wanted so many plots, but they only had this much episodes. It just kind of like smushed together. Do I wish that there's a season two? Yeah, because I would like to see them develop this more because as of right now, I'm still forgetting a lot of the characters. I still don't know that assistant's name. I still call her desk. The side characters are so minor. It's almost like if they weren't in there, I wouldn't have noticed. And as for the main characters, I still don't know that much about them. The most we know is V because there's a whole plot about her, Steve because he's in every episode and he is the main protagonist, Twink for a second because of his past being French and his name being Bastion, Deb a little bit because she does have a wife and there's an episode about her, and as for the rest of them, it's kind of like, oh, your entire past was put into two minutes. I don't even know why Stye went to prison. I'd like to figure that out and also know her secret that was mentioned in the wiki. I would be able to sympathize with Buck more if they didn't shove all of his past into literally a minute. It was like, oh, he was orphaned and then now he's very soft and that's it. 
it was it just happened he was a dick for the first six episodes and then afterwards he just turned into white diamond after she blushed in steven universe but overall like it's fine um, I don't have that many thoughts about it. I just still don't understand how those trailers portrayed the show. Like, what went wrong there in production. Sabotage. I, f I think it's sabotage. It would be nice to see this be its own standalone show for us to just laugh at because it's you know, supposed to be for the community. I just uh, wish there was more about the community in there. And lastly, I'm gonna mention again, for it being a show about queerness, we can show more aspects of it. I think they know it too. It's like, yeah, the main relationship is about two gay men who are white. Then you have Deb and Pam, and then you saw all those different lesbians. But as for like the rest of the community, it's not really there. Not that it has to be there, like outspokenly, oh, this is the trans character and we're gonna let you know because they're gonna wear white, pink, and blue. No, I don't need you to label all their sexualities and pronouns and write it on the wall for us to understand that yes you included them for diversity it'd just be nice to have characters with that as their storyline and have it make sense because even now it still doesn't make sense let me know your thoughts if you've watched it was it confusing for you also did you mind the jokes did you laugh at them if you couldn't laugh at the ariana grande one i'm just like you probably just didn't want to like the show at all I did. I think their jokes are funny, it's just sometimes they have too many. But don't hate watch, like, you know that if you go into a show wanting to dislike it, you end up disliking it, you pick at it. So give it a chance, like it's not a bad show. But if you enjoyed, give this video a like, leave a comment down below about your thoughts or what you want me to review next. I'm sorry it took so long to upload, I just I had a lot on my plate and also analyzing a show takes a long time. Follow my social media because y'all don't do it. That's right, I'll wait. Click it. You can't click it. And as always, I love you all, and everything is less than three. Now, take these goddamn earrings off. Oh my god, I've never felt earrings so chunky. This has weight to it. It feels luxe. to makeup look. Of course, it's beautiful. Why wouldn't it be? Oh my god. Oh, this is not fair. This just, it's not fair. It's not fair. Why am I not a makeup artist on here?